figure out the answer. It's 42. Uh, I've really I have a lot of math. All right. Yesterday. Hey, everybody. Hey. So this is a lot of folks. Crazy. This is going to be a little different than the other lectures I've been doing so far because, sorry. For the other lectures, I sort of did extensive preparation and had a lot of specific things to talk about in terms of what was going on. Uh, for this, I just sort of want to talk about four basic rules, play through those, and then talk with you about what criticisms you're interested in uh, knowing more about. So, yeah. Because I don't... So the biggest thing about the critical debate is that people freak out about it, and then they do a really terrible job because it's like they're not thinking. They're like, oh, God, it's a cave! I can't do this. I don't know this. I'm done. I'm finished. I'm not even going to try. Ah. And I really think that that is 95% of what happens in these rounds. And then you've got folks who are like <coughs> running generic arguments, and it doesn't really go anywhere. The first thing, and the number one rule I have, is that you should not panic, and you should think. So don't panic. Do think. That's the first thing, right? Because if you don't panic, you're going to do something, and it's going to be okay. Hopefully you'll generate some offense, and it'll be great. But also, if you think about things, you can find a pretty easy way to approach a lot of this stuff, right? One thing that I'll throw out there is that I think most critical alternatives are terrible. Vote, opposition, reject, X, Y, or Z seem like things that should have predictable offense against them every single time. If someone says, reject this thing, you hopefully have spent a little bit of time thinking of reasons why rejection might not be the best thing to do, why it might lead to a variety of problems, and explore some of those things. If someone says, do nothing about this problem, hopefully you can generate some predictable reasons about that, right? Think about the alternative. That's generally where I think the biggest weaknesses of criticisms are going to be found, is in the alternative. Because you want to know what? Vote op really doesn't do anything, nor does it mean anything per se. It's generally just something that people throw onto their counter plan to compete. And the thing about permutations is that you don't have to compete with everything. You don't have to perm everything. So you can just drop that vote off, and it doesn't do anything. People don't spend enough time thinking about how they want to deal with these problems and offering up projective solutions. So you hear, reject the neo-colonial drive, and it's like, sure. That's going to do what exactly? Nothing. Over and over and over again. That's just my own deal, though. And I also think that it's important to think about your alternatives, right? So an example of this that I will give is for years now, starting off with Texas Tech, moving over into Lewis and Clark to some extent, right? We've heard this big Lacan position, right? Lack, lack, lack. Got to embrace the lack. Do the plan without consequences. It's a beautiful floating pick. It solves all your case. What you going to do? Well, I mean, if you sit there and you think about it for a few minutes, right? They're endorsing, embracing the lack, and doing your plan without consequences. And that solves, right? Seems like, though, one of the things that they do do is spend about eight minutes talking about how this is important and offering a bunch of justifications, which people also often notice, right? So that might be a slight performative contradiction that you could start off with. And then you want to start thinking, like, what are some permutations that I might be able to have? And one thing that pops to my mind is basically their alternative text, only without the word plan in it, it says the word permutation. In order to embrace the lack, we offer the following permutation without consequences. Maybe if you made a double bind argument, you also link to your criticism, and then you run that permutation, and then you sit down. That might be a really effective way to deal with something like that. <laughs> I'm talking like, right, I'm talking right here, right, about probably a 45 second at most MG against an eight minute criticism. And that's terrifying, right? But I think that there is something to be said for that kind of total all-in strategy, right? Because also, and I mean, right, this, this is a position that has literally been run basically the same as it is for five years now, 
And over this time, right, you want to do that thinking and come up with those types of ideas. I think you can do that in the first speech, right? This is always an option, particularly for an eight-minute criticism. If someone reads an eight-minute criticism and you have no idea what it's about, everybody, how many of you are familiar with the concept of taking prep time during Parley? It's like a brilliant idea. You should do it when you have no idea what you're about to say. Sit down, think about it, come up with a strategy, right? Sometimes you can have really tricky strategies that only take a very limited amount of time. Sometimes you're going to have to talk a little faster because you took that extra minute, but it's always going to work out better for you if you didn't panic and you did think. Make sense? Cool. Second off, try to understand the criticism. I think that this is a pretty good piece of advice, but ask people what their thesis statement is. Ask them what they're basically trying to generate, and then answer whatever that is, right? A lot of the time, and I mean, this is also something that you can do with prep time, and I imagine that if you start your speech and then you just start asking them questions about their criticism, if they're all like, this is in my speech, I'm not answering questions, it's going to be pretty easy to just sort of say whatever you want to against the criticism judge is probably going to be relatively sympathetic. But I also don't imagine that that's what a team would do. So I think that you should take some time to try to understand what their criticism is saying. Try to figure it out. Just get to a thesis point and then make those arguments. Easiest place to go almost every time is the alternative. The alternative doesn't solve. The alternative causes bad things. The alternative is the alternative. It's crazy. Not too bad. Cool. The next thing you need to do is you need to know your knowledge base, right? Like, I can stand up here and give people advice all day long, and that advice is going to do functionally nothing if you don't know what I know, right? Like, I'm like, I, I, I just link term, most of these criticisms, occasionally impact term, but you know, you just stand up and you're like, oh yeah, I know what this is. I read a Gombin, I read Foucault, I read Nietzsche. Like, that's not going to be true for everybody. And so any advice that I offer you is all going to depend on what you know, right? Like, I coached Kevin Calderwood for, a, for two years. Coaching Kevin Calderwood, I can't be all like, yeah, Kevin, what you really need to do here is you need to link turn that criticism and then go for a permutation, right? I can say that, but that's not going to do any good. On the other hand, Kevin has a giant database of knowledge in his brains about the amazingness of American hegemony and realism. If I tried to make that argument, well, I'd probably vomit on myself just a little bit first, and then I would totally lose, because I have zero ability to make those arguments and generate those things, right? But if that's what you've got in your head, you should utilize those toolboxes, right? Always, in every circumstance, Answering a criticism is going to be about going to a knowledge base that you're comfortable in. There can be a huge number of knowledge bases. And you've got to know what you're comfortable doing so that you can formulate these strategies, right? One thing that I would encourage you to do is that if you start using your knowledge base and you find out maybe it needs some work, do that work, right? Just because you know something doesn't mean you can't learn more. But you want to start off with the things that you know the most about. You're always going to do better if you can drag a debate into an arena at which, in which you have a lot of different examples, right? And one thing that I would tell you a good way to do this is to try to draw analogs from the criticism into bodies of literature or places that you know tons about, right? Some people are like, I'm Latin America all the way. I know everything about that country. Other people are like, Russia, definitely. Some folks are like, domestic policy, I know tons. If you could start trying to create analogies between fields of knowledge that you are deep in and the types of things the criticism is talking about, you're more likely to be able to generate arguments against that, right? So you need to know your knowledge base. The last thing, and this one's, this one's the shortest, but it's also probably the most important, and that is prepare to answer specific criticisms. Read about them, right? So policy debate in particular has gotten really big on open evidence projects. And at the end of a year, even during a year, huge number of files and arguments are available to you, oftentimes with cut cards and research bases. You can look at those, figure out where those articles are, and go read those articles. 
It often doesn't take the longest amount of time to do this reading, and you'll start to discover a lot of these things, right? One piece of preparing that I also think is important for folks to remember is that within a lot of different literature bases, there are going to be some pretty substantial conflicts over a variety of aims and goals in a huge number of ways. And those conflicts are all places where you can usually, generally, predictably produce offense against those arguments, right? So say someone's running a position that's based on queer theory. If you're familiar with the body of literature in queer theory, particularly stuff like uh, black queer studies or people of color queer studies in general, right, you can probably generate some offense about the ways that those things work, right? How many of you have heard no future, right? Reject the child. It's a big post-structuralist queer theory argument that talks about how we need to reject the way that reproductive futurism operates by locking us into temporality and moving towards that, right? Well, one thing about that is that that is what's generally identified as the anti-social thesis in queer theory. Then there are all of these theorists on the other side of that debate who are engaged in what might be identified as the social theorists in queer theory, right? And so you've got Lee Edelman on one side, and then you have folks that are basically writing in the same body of knowledge, like Jose Esteban Munoz in Cruising Utopia, who is doing nothing but arguing against that stance, right? The thing, and when people, when you do this research, when you're doing this type of preparation, you can find those conflicts and get to what the debate is, right? Like, a lot of the antisocial thesis, or yeah, a lot of folks who are arguing for antisocial thesis in queer theory tend to be privileged white dudes who have the ability to be like, whatever, fuck the family, fuck the world, fuck the child, let's move on, right? And then you have people like Jose Esteban Munoz who says that that is a position that doesn't work for a lot of people for whom family is a much more predictable route towards safety, towards being able to live their lives in the now than anything else. And to just say, reject all of these things is an awfully privileged perspective. And you can draw on those types of arguments to answer that, right? But you only find out where these points of tension are if you're doing the reading, if you're preparing for these arguments, and if you're getting into it. Do those basically make sense? Those are the big overarching things that I think apply to answering specific Ks in almost every circumstance. What I want to do now is I want to ask you about what criticisms you would be interested in talking more about. And hopefully I'll have some information about those. We talk about a variety of different stances. Yeah? I just wanted to ask, like, it, it's, so to say you're the affirmative and you're going kind of to the right, like you're using the military, you know, even if it's to save people or like, you know, do, do something like that, um, is it better to use uh, ghost just for dissatisfaction at all in impact terms instead of attempting a permutation since the worlds are so different? Or do you, so is that sort of judgment? Yeah. I mean, those types of decisions are decisions that you need to make based on the context of your affirmative and the criticism that's being run against you, right? If you have an affirmative that is going to increase military presence in some place, and the other team reads militarism against you, you are probably not going to get very far with a permutation and some wink turns that are... Whatever. I mean, there are ways, right? If you're transforming the way that the military operates, you might be able to make some link turn arguments about needing a fundamental alteration of the structures of militarism, those types of arguments. And with a permutation, that could be effective. But if you're, like, straight up advocating for military power and the other team says military power is bad, you probably don't want to waste your time being like, oh, we could, like, permute this. <laughs> we could totally... Yeah, I mean, you want to go for things like impact turns. You want to go for things like disads to the alternative. And you probably, in that case, also want to throw out a little bit of framework. Hurts me to say that, but it's probably <laughs> true. Yeah? Uh, how do you answer like Well, femk? OK. One thing, that it is important, one thing that's important to answering a femk is to remember that fem is not a monolithic body, right? So you're talking about a variety of different types of feminisms that might be leveraged in any given circumstance. Depending on what that type of feminism is, there are going to be a variety of authors from feminist perspectives who have talked about this. And so the easiest way to answer, answer a femk is to do a lot of reading within feminisms 
and figure out how and where some of the conflict points are, right? You can also look for things that that theory generally supports. For instance, um, right, like ecofeminism right now uh, is primarily represented in contemporary politics by groups like the Deep Green Resistance, which is an organization that adheres to what they identify as radical feminist tenets, and they promote those types of things. One of the things about that that has currently become particularly salient is that a lot of those radical feminists are also identified in a group that some might call trans-exclusive radical feminists, right? TERFs. And you could make arguments about why the logic of ecofeminism is inherently tied into this essentialism of gender and why that leads to violence against particular types of bodies, their exclusion and the punishment of those populations, right? But these are only debates that you're going to know about if you're staying up on these general topics, right? It would probably be helpful to have read about the deep green resistance, to know some of the ways that ecofeminism got to where it is and how those kind of conflicts took place, right? And then you have a giant, beefy decide to the alternative in a certain, to a, a large extent. I mean, yeah, there's, and that, that sort of stretches across a variety of feminisms. You've got these conflict points between different authors, right? So one book that I'll just tell you all about right now that I'm particularly excited about was supposed to actually come out today, and it looks like they pushed the publication deadline back to the 20th, so I'm going to have to wait a few more days. But it's a book called Habeas Viscous, and it is drawing on, it's examining the use of theories of biopower and the bear life, so Foucault and Agamben, from a black feminist perspective in order to argue that the ways that these theories develop are fundamentally race, um, fundamentally approach these questions in a colorblind manner, which doesn't deal with some pretty serious issues, right? And I imagine that out of this book, there are going to be a variety of pretty serious disads to any type of biopower or a Gombin argument that someone might run, right? <coughs> And this is about getting into that literature, finding people who are talking about it, right? Because once you read one of those books, you've got people who've been all up in this literature. Can you repeat the name of that book? Uh, yeah, it's Habeas Viscous. Um, let me just... It's got a great title. Habeas Viscous, Racializing Assemblages, Biopolitics, and Black Feminist Theories of the Human. <laughs> Habeas Viscous, Racializing Assemblages, Biopolitics, and Black Feminist Theories of the Human. I'm super excited about this. The intro is pretty hot. <laughs> is that viscous with a V or a B like bear? V. Viscous. So what's like, can you explain Femi-R? Femi-R, I mean, yeah. So one of the things about a lot of the uses of feminisms in debate is that they often emerge out of a variety of second wave conceptualizations of the world. And I generally characterize the second wave as being particularly gender essentialist. I think that, that characterizes a lot of the different types of feminisms that were arising out of the second wave, like power feminism, women of color feminism, lesbian separatism, ecofeminism, all right, on and on and on and on. But, right, so Fem IR generally argues that the way that we approach international relations is based on a masculine perspective in which people attempt to dominate other countries through the exercise of hard military power, right? And I mean, even in that characterization, you can hear the patriarchy starting to mm -hmm. sort of seep out, right? Dominate. Mm -hmm. Exactly, <laughs> dominate. Hard military power. We need hard power in order to increase our hegemony, right? <laughs> All of those types of things. And it argues that when we engage in international relations, we need to shift our perspective to account for a more feminine view, which would probably be based in things like diplomacy and peacemaking, attempting to 
engage with others as opposed to push them away and control them through the uh, through uh, these exercises of power. Doesn't that just further entrench the gender binary? Like when you're saying these actions are masculine and these actions are feminine. I mean, I think that that is a disad that a lot of fem IR positions run the risk of linking into. I imagine you're going to have people who talk a lot. Yeah, I mean, when you make that disadvantage, the opponent, your opponents, whoever's running the fem IR position is likely to stand up and say, well, we're not really saying that these masculine or feminine traits are necessarily tied to some sort of biology, and in that sense, we're not upholding the gender binary, right? But if you know this type of stuff, you can do evolutionary work to explain the trajectories. You can pretty clearly identify why maybe some of these theories are linked to that and do entrench the gender binary and lead to violence against bodies that fall outside of the gender binary or violence against bodies that are differently gendered, right? Like the exclusion of female masculinities to talk about what Halberstam, or to talk about Halberstam's work in that field, right? And so you can do a lot of those types of arguments. Yeah? Can we talk about like Anzus What? Anzus This is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, Anzus to Derrida. Preferably, right, I mean, one of the risks that Derrida certainly approaches is a veering into, into nihilism. And I think that that is something that you could talk about a lot when you discuss these sort of situations of deconstruction. Um, so when you mean Derrida, do you mean like deconstruction, erasure, like... Yeah, I mean like, like Jones was just like Derrida, from what I understand, talk about how we deconstruct. I mean, in those types of cases, right, like, you could either, I think that one way of generating link turns against a position like that is to point out how your case destabilizes in a variety of senses sort of naturalized understandings of the world. I think that a lot of the 1ACs or the PMCs that folks run, right, generally your PMC tends to be some sort of lefty policy, right? These are one of the reasons why I think that it's very productive to utilize permutation arguments in conjunction with link terms. Because lefty policies are often going to give you some sort of leverage into a lot of these types of questions, right? So if you can identify certain stable types of notions that your case begins to problematize or deconstruct, you can start utilizing those arguments as link terms to the Derrida opposition, and then hopefully that'll provide specific solvency for some sort of stable alternative. I think that possible disads to that often run along the lines of nihilism, right? We're not going to act because we got caught up constantly deconstructing. A lot of it depends, I think, on what the alternative is to the Derrida opposition, right? Like, he points out some specific things. You could also take a materialist perspective on the world, right? For Derrida, there's nothing outside of the text. Um, for a variety of folks who sort of write about these issues, they would say that there are bodies outside of the text and that the way those bodies yeah, have power exercised on them is particularly sort of vicious and something that you would want to investigate. And for a route like this, it sort of gets, I think, a really good book that talks about the differences and sort of walks <laughs> along the edge of discursive and material theories is a book called Bodies in Pain. Um, it's, an extended, it's an extended meditation on the way that torture operates in the world. Uh, it's a little older at this point, probably mid-90s. Um, I'm trying to remember the author. It's a pretty great book, though. Uh, I'd suggest it for some of these sort of questions about the difference <coughs> between discourse and material. Elaine Scary, which is a great name for a book about torture. But there are two R's. It's like scary only with two R's. Scarier. <laughs> yep, exactly. The body in pain, the making and unmaking of the world. And I think that that is a really interesting way to approach some of these questions of the differences between discourse and material. Um, 
Elaine Scary is probably a little more on the discourse, shapes a lot of these things question, but it's definitely walking that line and encouraging you to think about that. And I mean, right, like a lot of philosophical positions are going to have differences based on these types of commitments, right? Different commitments between the discursive approach to the world or a sort of materialistic approach, or ma not materialistic, but material approach to the world, right? Looking at the world as something that doesn't necessarily just exist in language that exists outside of that, right? Like materialism and sort of the material theories are often very present in Marxist work, whereas you get in some of the more post-structuralist and post-modern works, you're going to see more of an emphasis on the discursive, right? And people will have ways to say that the material world is discursive and we shouldn't try to divide them off from one another. But that's a tension point that you can often exploit across different types of criticisms that I don't see people talking about very much. These sort of differences between material conceptions of the world and discursive conceptions. Do you have something? I just had a strategy question when you start engaging in this because um, I'm thinking as you get into the critical debates, if you step back as the affirmative, probably both sides would say, yo, your plan's a bad idea. And at the end of the day, so you like link to your offense, if that makes sense. Do you suggest kind of focusing in on the impact term in these situations when you throw down on a theoretical impact debate on a critique, or does it not matter as much? You know, I think it I probably doesn't matter, matter as much. I think that, are you talking about like impact turning your criticism? Or? Like I'm just thinking feminism example, right? Uh, a lot of women of color feminists will criticize fem IR, but they will also criticize your policy of sending the military into whatever place. So, and they would agree that that's patriarchal. But yet, that's a very good argument to fem IR to just prove fem IR, but it also would say, oh, my app is probably a bad idea. That, you know, I mean. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I think that that is a risk that you would take, and you'd probably want to either focus on the impact turn or the case if that got exploited in a debate round. I think that a lot of people don't do that type of relational thinking across positions into how these different arguments are going to be interacting with one another, and that's just generally a problem that I think a lot of folks have, particularly in part of the debate. There's no prep time. We don't have a lot of leisure to think through these things. Someone's going to be talking very quickly at you for probably 45 minutes, pretty close to all the way through. So you don't have a lot of time for that type of leisure. It's also one of the reasons why I don't like conditional, oh, conditional debates in Parley very much. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah? How do you go about answering both of those? Like That's a terrible idea. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, I mean, I really like Vaudrillard because he once said that Americans may have no culture, but they do have very nice teeth. And I think he was very on to something with that particular claim. Um, <laughs> beyond that, I don't... I think that alternative offense against Vaudrillard is particularly easy to generate. Um, because most of the time, right, Baudrillard criticisms are going to ultimately impact to being like, understand the world is a simulacra, or do nothing, it's all sort of ridiculous joke. And I think that those are great cases to really leverage. Uh, yeah, I think that is a particularly good criticism to leverage. No, yo, stuff goes on outside of the world, and there are people out there that are actually suffering and Every 28 hours, a black man is killed in an extrajudicial execution by the state apparatus. And that is not something that is just a reflection of a reflection of a reflection, but has like actual impacts on people's actual life. And maybe we should let go of this staring at ourselves thing for a little while. Right? And I, yeah, I just really, I think, I think that there are those types of criticisms, right? Disaster pornography or is another one of those types of arguments that I think lends itself very well to just being like, your alternative is a terrible idea, it allows people to suffer, and you're so caught up in philosophy that you're going to like gleefully dance as people die, and that's not something we should do. And I think that people, you, know, you just want to be comfortable going all in on those claims. And right, at that point, particularly against some of those criticisms, right, you can leverage literally 
every terrible thing that is happening in the world in order to generate offense against that position, right? If it's a reflection of a reflection of a reflection in the Iraq war that never happened, what does that mean for the Palestinians suffering in Gaza? If it's a reflection of a reflection of a reflection, how are we going to deal with ISIS throughout the Middle East? If it's a reflection of a reflection of a reflection, how are we going to encounter Ferguson in St. Louis, right? And you just go in on those types of questions. And I think that there's pretty, yeah, I think that it's a pretty persuasive impact on most of the time. Yeah? What do you think is the best arguments against the leader of the language? <laughs> I mean, I think it depends a lot on what side you're on. Bleeker is definitely in a discursive sort of construction of the world. And so um, trying to leverage some sort of material reality against that might, yeah, that materialism is a more important thing, might be an effective sprout. Um, I also think that trans, I think on the negative, the transversal dissent argument makes it hard to avoid a permutation debate a lot of the time. I think that permutations against Bleeker, well, both on, yeah, on affirmative, yeah, when you're running it on negative, is particularly difficult because, yeah, to some extent, conceptualizing your alternative is something that necessarily needs to stay pure, is probably engaging in the logic of the grand event, that type of stuff. Matt? Um, our, I was wondering if there's arguments you can use in, like, the framework of the PMC to, like, preempt. Um, certain like alternative arguments. Like what do you mean? Um, like uh, for instance, like the alternatives are like do nothing or like reject, um, and then like you can preempt it with like maybe like I don't know I don't necessarily want to say moral obligation to act, but something along those lines. Okay. Yeah, I think that there are things that you can put in there. One of the risks, and this is just something I'll say generally to everybody, right? Like. A lot of people will front load PMCs with reasons that you shouldn't run critical arguments, these types of questions. I don't always know how far that necessarily gets you, especially if you don't know for a fact that they're going to be making those arguments. Um, and so front loading the PMC can be an effective strategy, but a lot of the time you'll find that you're just sort of wasting PMC time that you could have used to construct more of a specific story around the particular things that are happening in the advantage. A larger question of PMC construction that I think people should do more thinking about and work on trying to alter is that when you know someone is going to be running a particular negative argument against you, your PMC should probably be tailored in order to encounter that negative argument. For instance, I don't know why at the NPTE people roll into rounds against Brandon Rivera and his partner. Um, when they know that he's going to be making this big race argument about interrogating race in debate with the generic advantages that you prepped before the NPTE started about that topic. I think that at the very least you would probably want to be spending your 20, time, 20 minutes during prep time to link that topic to an explicitly racialized lens and analyze the problem areas of that topic through those things which at least gives you some sort of topic-specific play on a link turn to the criticism and better arguments against the alternative. I think that in those types of cases, right, I have no idea when you know what someone's going to be saying on the negative, why your case is generic and pre-prepped or written in advance. That is, something that, that is something that you should be altering your case substantially to encounter in order to give yourself play on these types of arguments. And not just in the sense that, well, I'm going to totally front load with all these killer policy-making good arguments that I'm certain NAU has never heard before, right? It's about trying to make sure that you have a topic-specific, but, yeah, a topic-specific perspective that is also going to give you some sense of play against whatever that negative argument is, right? Other criticisms that you have questions about? Yeah? I don't know if it's a K, but do you want to talk about Leotard? About Leotard? Um, I mean, he's awesome. 
I, I don't know if I've ever really seen Leotard get used in debate rounds. Leotard from what? How could it be? Um, talk a lot of talk about meta narratives, probably. You're like, this is the meta narrative you construct, and this is why it's problematic, and we're totally incredulous about your meta narrative. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess that's really, that's where I enter into the leotard and largely leave him, is with post, the postmodern condition is defined by an incredulity towards meta narratives. I think mean, that's a quality quotation that explains a lot of what's going on there. Um, so yeah, I don't necessarily know beyond that. I guess one thing that I'll say generally speaking, and I guess this gets away from leotard in particular, but just about thinking about how to engage with these different types of arguments, right? I said that I think that the alternative is one of the most valuable places to encounter. And I also think that you should be gen generating arguments against predictable alternative mechanisms like reject or rethink or these types of things, right? You can, always, you can write a lot of predictable offense against a generic type alternative mechanism. That is often what people are going to slap on there. But you can also look at alternative texts in order to figure out, in particular, what type of thing you might want to do, right? Um, because the words, that are in, the words that are involved in alternative text largely define or sort of take place, yeah, largely define or <coughs> explain what perspective that team is going to be taking. And so if you can isolate a word out of an alternative text that you think is particularly bad or a problem, you can generate a lot of offense against that type of stuff, right? Like, when people use the term whiteness to describe the problem of white supremacy, they are engaging in a particular type of discursive move in order to characterize questions in a specific way, and you can generate offense against that type of thing, right? And so I think that paying attention to the words that are in an alternative is a really good way to go when trying to answer these criticisms. How would you answer um, ethics-based arguments like Rubinoff's if you're not coming from like a very specifically ethical like that place? What do you mean? Like what? you don't want to like um, how do you answer like issues of like ethical relationships with the other if you don't want to get into the like nitty gritty of like the ethics questions of Rubinoff's? Probably through leveraging your PMC as some sort of ethical, yeah, through through that ethical sort of lens, right? And I mean, that's that's the link term debate, right? And this is something that I think people forget about, right? When you hear that cap debate, if your plan is doing something that's probably it's like better for people, you can leverage a lot of link terms and talk about the need for these types of changes, right? Like. Single payer healthcare all right, would be awesome. People could still argue that you exist within a capitalist system, for instance, but you can probably leverage some pretty sick link terms to that type of position. I think that Levinas is largely the same, right? The number of times you are really defended, you are really required by a resolution to take a perspective that is going to make you incapable of saying, yeah, this is about recognizing our obligation to the other in some sense, is pretty small, right? Resolutions don't often, I mean, like, once a tournament, maybe, you'll get a resolution that's like, hard right, hard right, invade this country. But in all other circumstances, you, and I mean, even in the world of invading a country, there are ways to argue that through a, pers yeah, there are ways to say that that's about responding to obligations, right? the way that the Iraq war was originally conceptualized by a bunch on the left, which was that Saddam Hussein is a twisted, terrible person who's torturing people and totally horrible. Maybe we should do something about that. And we ultimately choose to pretend like he's got nuclear weapons, and then the human rights concerns start getting discussed afterwards, right? But these types of questions, how you justify things and the parts of that controversy you're looking at, are largely where you can generate a lot of these link terms. Yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, Nietzsche as a thread in the debate? I mean, there's like four or five different like bastardizations of it, but like yeah, I mean generically. that's that's the issue. That is the, one of the big issues with Nietzsche is that you have to figure out what flavor folks are running. Like for instance, I prefer Deleuzian Nietzsche. I think that he's the happiest of them all. <laughs> um, 
other people are going to be rocking out with different varieties of this. I think that a lot of the time, offense against doing, so doing nothing veers towards the most terrible mischaracterizations of Nietzsche, which is that he was a nihilist. Nietzsche was not a nihilist. He hated nihilism with a fiery passion. They were the worst kind of people. Um, just an interesting side note about Nietzsche. But in order to answer that, I think that offense against do nothing is a particularly sort of interesting way um, to approach that because that is, the tr that is the primary way that he gets conceptualized in debate rounds. It's an advocate of just sort of letting shit go. It's not really his deal at all. Um, very much creative self-affirmation, I suppose. But I think that that is a good way to go with it. Talking about how they take Nietzsche and transform him into a nihilist is probably a pretty effective thing. Um, I think there are a lot of potential link turns, um, which gets harder. Yeah, which gets, the permutation is often very difficult in these debates because of the moral ethical system you've probably justified at some point during your PMC. But I think that you can make arguments about the transformation of ethics. It's about a lot of the time, it's just about being better at that literature than folks. And so, do a little bit of reading, and it gets a lot easier. I really like permutations and link terms, in case you haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> That's my faves. But, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about how to answer alternative uh, styles or formats, like performance-oriented type of arguments? I mean, I think that the, the primary thing, well, first off, I would love to see people actually doing some more performative things in debate. I don't think that we have very much of it in Parley right now. Um, the closest we got is like Alyssa Sambor writing words on her body and Brandon taking off his suit at the NPTE. Um, Concordia's, Concordia has a statism argument where the big performative moment is putting a mask over your face and reading the alternative. And I think that there are a lot of ways to get into these types of questions a lot more deeply. Answering them, I think, has, there are a couple ways to answer them, right? You can generate offense against the particular type of performative engagement that they're doing, right? Narratives will have a particular type of offense against it, whereas poetry will have a different type of offense against it. And fictional stories will have different types of offense against it. And then I think a good way to do it is to endorse an alternate form of performance, right? And this is one thing that I think that people don't utilize enough, right? Because it is important to remember that absolutely everything that happens in a debate round is some crazy type of performance, right? There's nothing more performative than someone staring at a sheet of paper and screaming it at you without ever looking up or acknowledging anyone in any kind of sense, right? That is a very distinct, very performative type of moment. The way that debate rounds are structured largely, with audiences all riding on sheets of paper and not making eye contact or even looking at the speaker for the most part, is very, very performative. And I think that it's useful to start by thinking about and recognizing the way that all of these things are performance. And then I think you can generate offense in a variety of senses through arguing what your performance was and why that performance was useful. So if you if you're saying like that by someone just like looking down and writing, like you say that's a, that's a performance. By performance, do you mean like a symbolic way that in which we you know replicate something or like a stand for something? What what is your de specific definition of? I mean, in that sense, performance is just about existing. That's the performance of the everyday. Um, it's the performance of the everyday of debate, I guess. That's kind of what I'm talking about, mundane performances in particular. And I think, right, that you can generate, yeah, if, if you start realizing this, there are ways to talk about what your performance is that are either good or bad. And you can do this from either side, largely. Like, you can critique what someone's aesthetic choice is when they decide to punch over and read. Or you can defend your aesthetic choice in that from a huge number of perspectives. It's the performance is everything, which means performance is nothing, which means performance is everything, circuit, circle.
it's like all the K's you wanted to know about, or is it just not specific enough for you? Awesome. I mean, if you want specific suggestions about different things, um, you can talk to me about that. Uh, I also think that it's surprisingly easy to find books and articles on a lot of these topics just by typing it into Google, and I think that that is a seriously underused research route a lot of the time when it comes to critical arguments, because in the end there really isn't a silver bullet against critical arguments or against anything, really. It's about getting into that literature, doing the reading, encountering the examples, and figuring out how to take your knowledge base and apply it across a variety of contexts as effectively as possible. Cool. I think that pretty much takes us to the end, so y'all can roll out.